the, the reasons why people um, from uh, British, indigenous people from British North America traveled uh, first had to do with the arrival of Europeans, um, just very, very sort of simply. Uh, the spread of colonialism um, affected people, um, sometimes warfare. Uh, in the case of John Norton, who is a uh, Scots, Cherokee, and uh, adopted Mohawk man from the Six Nations, who traveled to Britain in 1804 and again in 1815 uh, as part of a mission to try and solve land problems at the Grand River. Uh, and also then, uh, when he made a second trip, to advance himself in the military, as he was also a member of the British military. So the pres presence of Europeans had quite a lot to do with that. With that travel, um, and yes, we do. You know, we tend to think of indigenous people as particularly rooted in place. Um, and my my re research has shown that 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 uh, some of that travel actually took place because of their desire to stay in place. So, for example, people who traveled in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, up to 1860 to try and settle land claims. Um, in the case of Peter Jones, who was a Methodist uh, missionary, a member of the Mississauga um, Band, an Anishinaabe group of people who lived around Lake Ontario. Uh, Jones went to, to Britain in 1837 to try and prevent the removal of his people to Manitoulin Island and was actually successful. He also traveled to Britain a number of times to raise funds for Methodist missions to uh, the, the Mississauga. Uh, in the case of Catherine Sutton, who was um, Jones's niece, another uh, Mississauga woman, uh, Sutton traveled to Britain in 1860 to obtain an audience with Queen Victoria in order to petition for the return of her land, which had been seized by the Indian Department and put up for auction, and for various reasons, mostly having to do with her having married a white man, she was not allowed to bid on that land and buy it back. Now, she was successful in getting her land back. A number of people were not. Uh, so, so there are those sort of larger political um, kind of circumstances that uh, f made it necessary, um, but in some ways I would say facilitated people's overseas travel. The other group of people I look at are children of the fur trade. Um, and in that case, it's the economic expansion of the fur trade into the northwest of uh, northwest country, into Rupert's land. These were um, boys and sometimes girls who were sent to England and Scotland by their Scottish and English fathers for education um, and training. And often that meant uh, a degree of acculturation and ad adaptation to European um, manner. So it's uh, you know part, partly economic, but also about the creation of new kinds of families, new kinds of domestic lives that moved those children um, around. And in some cases, they they went back to um, Red River or to Rupert's Land. In other cases, they stayed in in Britain. And in a few cases, they ended up in places like India and Australia um, as part of large-scale European migrations around the British Empire in the 19th century. The other group of people I look at are performers, um, people like Pauline Johnson, for example, or uh, her counter male counterpart from Six Nations, John Brant Sarrow. And in their case, um, it's, it's in some cases, I think, a little bit more complicated um, because they didn't actually have the necessity of traveling for political petitioning. But, I th but in the context of the late 19th century expansion of performance circuits, uh, both Johnson and Brant Sarrow traveled to the United States, um, and in particular to Britain, where they appeared on uh, a number of different kinds of stages. John Sarrow actually appeared as a white man in Wild West shows, um, and then lectured about his people's anthrop anthropology, spiritual practices, and so on. Um, and then he, he too married a white woman. Um, uh, after having a relationship with a, a young Irish um, housewife in Liverpool. Um, and he ended up in family court, actually, in Liverpool, being hauled up on charges of failure to pay uh, child support. But la later, in, so later uh, after that incident, he, he married the um, widow of a British clergyman who was also very interested in um, collecting Aboriginal artifacts. And in a way, she kind of collected Brant Serro, too, uh, marrying him, helping him with his career, returning to Canada for a while, where they lived outside of um, Six Nations on the border of the reserve and uh, European land, and uh, hosting big parties, um, Canada Day celebrations, things, things like that, or not Canada Day, but um, 
Victoria Day celebrations. Uh, and then uh, Brant Stower returned with her to Britain, um, where he spent the rest of his life, um, dying there in 19, 1914. Um, and again, le lecturing, appearing in um, various theatrical productions, including a male beauty pageant in um, southern, southern England on the coast at one point, um, not too long before he died. And I think he, he did this, um, you know, in order to have uh, opportunities, in order to have adventure. He also went to South Africa 1901 and uh, volunteered to fight in the South African War and was turned down because he was not white. And at, what, at which point he wrote a long letter to the Times of London com protesting his exclusion from, uh, from the war. Um, so there are very, various kinds of reasons why people traveled, um, but you know, a lot of them had to do with the increasing encroachment of Europeans into their traditional lands, um, their uh, concern that their resources were going, you know, going to be taken um, and that treaties were not going to be ob observed. Um, but I think in, in doing so, in, 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 they, they also exposed themselves to different kinds of audiences and in many ways attempted to educate British audiences uh, about indigenous people, um, particularly in southern Ontario. Uh, about their their practices, their their culture, and their history, and their particularly their history of alliances with uh, with the British.